Here's our lovely magnolia tree, all in flower specially for you. And next to it is the green gauge tree, which we put in at the same time. And it is growing very tall and squirrels get all the green gauges at the top. But we do get a lot of green gauges. Now we're moving over towards the pond. Some snakes had some fritillaries there in there, which Dave might be able to film if he knows what they are. Okay, this is our lovely sitting area that we know that's all a bit of a mess at the minute, but at least the tulips are out. Again, in your honour. So, when she was young, she was the person that she was to become. She was into everything and she was brilliant at everything she did. <laughs> you know, she did the guides and the brownies with all the badges on the arms. She was in every school play from the nativity play at Infant School, where she was obviously Mary, right up to senior school plays. Played a guitar in school concerts and did school sports teams, hockey and tennis. She made quilts and she pressed flowers and she watched birds. She just had an insatiable appetite for doing things. I first met Sue when she was five years old. She was a pupil at Letchmore Infant School in Stevenage, where I was head teacher. And she was there from five to seven years old. Seven happened to be the year that Apollo landed on the moon. And I said to the children, I want you to put down in any way you like how that made you feel. Sue wrote a poem. Shall I quote it to you? The moon is very dark and still. It's very far away. There are rocks upon her surface. Beware, astronaut, beware. Sue is a quiet, charming, bright, attractive girl, an ideal pupil. I first met Sue when she was 11 years old. She came to Barclay School in Stevenage, which was just down the road from where she lived in Western Road with her mum, dad, and brother David. She was an absolutely prodigious talent when she was young. I met her once coming out of the school library. She had a copy of Far From The Madding Crowd in her hand, which she'd just taken out. And in the Harold Rosen lecture that she gave in about 2016, she wrote about how when she was in the sixth form and we were visiting Hardy's Cottage in Upper Bockhampton, she wrote how the poem The Self Unseeing always sent a shiver down her spine. Part of me, she wrote, is forever in that cottage with our teacher standing in the doorway reading the poem and us silently waiting for the dead feet to walk in. Well, blessings emblazoned that day and Sue wasn't looking away. She never did. I met Sue when we both started secondary school at age 11. We became friends. We were partners in a tennis team. I had an awful serve about which she was very patient until she wasn't. We were an incredibly swatty group. We actually did Latin O-level in our lunch times. We even watered our German teacher's garden for her when she was away on holiday. <laughs> but mostly, I remember we had a lot of fun. We used to take our um, Saturday job money up to Sloan Square and buy floral things off the Laura Ashley sail rail. We went on mammoth bike rides to see George Bernard Shaw's revolving writing hut. But most of all, I remember her laugh. Well, Sue was my oldest friend. We met in our first year as students at Nottingham University in 1981, but it wasn't until Sue graduated and started a teacher training in 1983 that we fully progressed from good pals to close friends. I moved to Berlin for a year and Sue started sending me these wonderful letters, beautifully handwritten, and after she met Dave that autumn, she was keen to introduce us at the first possible opportunity as she knew we would hit it off. And she was absolutely right. On my return from Berlin, the three of us started hanging out on a regular basis. A lot of pinball was involved at that stage. A Sue was a dap hand at pinball. And once I met my partner, Kevin, in 1985, the three became a four and we remained that way for the next 38 years. She was a steadfast, loyal friend, and she grew more and more into her best self as the years progressed and as her career progressed. She really did 
live her best life. It might be a well-worn phrase, but I feel it sums Sue up perfectly. I noticed Sue on the first day of our teacher training course, because she was gorgeous. I was sure she was out of my league, but our shared interest kept pushing us together. Then we were asked to jointly present at the seminar and I found out how tough and talented she was. I got around to my house and worked at the nerve to ask her out. I think it was all the novels and poetry collections on my badly built shelves that persuaded her to give me a chance. By the end of the course, we were writing stories together. She found a job in Nottingham and moved into my rented house in Radford. The following year, we bought a small terrace in Bobber's Mill. That was where we each started writing in earnest. First met Sue back in September 1984, Dane Court Comprehensive School, Radcliffe on Trent. It was a very creative place. So I remember the faces we all wore, the joy especially when you come from a class and you've got a really wonderful piece of writing that you've elicited from one of the students in your class. And for Sue, that was what she was about. That was what she was after. That was what she inspired me to do, particularly with poetry, because it was Sue who was the great networker of our department. It was Sue who came back with all sorts of resources and ideas for developing our teaching of poetry. It was from Sue's inspiration that I, in turn, managed to inspire other students in the way that Sue's own teachers had inspired her. I first met Sue Dimmock at uh, the Arvon Foundation's Totley Barton Centre in 1986 and three things struck me straight away. The first one was her absolute hunger for poetry, that we'd talk about poems all day and then we'd have dinner and she'd carry on talking about poems. First thing in the morning she'd be talking about poems. Poems seemed to me to be her absolute lifeblood. The same thing is that that week was the week of the Chernobyl disaster and Sue thought about that disaster and we all were. And it struck me that she was a poet who thought very hard about the poet's place in the world so that poetry can react and maybe help to shape the huge things that are happening in the world. And her poetry and her approach to teaching other people poetry has always been based in that engagement that poetry must take its place in the world. And Tolly Barnes is supposed to be haunted by the ghost of some kind of cavalier. And I was convinced that I'd seen him. And I said to Sue, do you know, I think I've seen the top half of this cavalier. And she said, well, Ian, I think that's the kind of thing you can only see in a poem. And I thought, ah, she's right. So I realised that in the end, she had a wonderful kind of wisdom, knowing that really there are certain ghosts that you can only see in poems. I met Sue when uh, we were both doing teacher fellowships at Cambridge University uh, and it was only by chance that I discovered that there was another English teacher at another college. So it was one of those things that seemed to be written in the stars and so when we first met each other we obviously had a great deal to talk about and swore to keep in touch. That time in Cambridge was also important because I met Sue literally just a few days before I met my partner, who became Sue's friend at pretty much the same time as he became my friend. So yeah, the Cambridge meeting had reverberations over the next 23 years. And perhaps most importantly of all was the poem which Sue and Pietro wrote together when she first came down with cancer. She'd always been interested in science. So she was very interested in uh, where her cancer came from and how it had happened. And Pietro, being a biochemist and a poet, was the obvious person to talk to about this. And they ended up writing this beautiful, very complex DNA poem reflecting on the nature of those genetic mutations. I came across Sue's work when I read her paper in English in Education. So I sent an email to her, hoping that she would be interested in providing her insights to my doctoral research. And she replied, I can meet you for half an hour. <laughs> so I went to University of Leicester for the 30 minutes meeting. You travelled all the way to the UK for a 30 minute meeting? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> she suggested joint research between UK and Japan. 
and I invited Sue and David to visit Hiroshima University in 2017. So they conducted poetry and creative workshops and seminars. And once after dinner, we stepped outside and witnessed the beautiful snowfall. Sue said, I love snow and she loves poetry of Louise Magnus of Snow. That was a very special night for me. My PhD was all about teaching poetry to children and that's what Sue's was as well. And then she turned hers really into an amazing book about drafting and assessing poetry, which was inspirational for me because I suddenly felt like, oh, there's somebody else who's talking my language. No one else seemed to be asking those questions at that point. Anyway, this is the early 2000s. We got invited to speak at UKLA. This is in Swansea in 2007. But on the way home, I remember, we got the same train and we just didn't stop talking. We just had all these plans and ideas, which was just spewing out of us. And we just kept in touch. We both had some study leave around 2015 where we wrote a sort of more theoretical paper about poetry writing development, as we called it, very much seeing it as something that is to do with the social lives of poets and how they engage with each other and each other's work. And that provided the framework for a book that we are still in the process of putting together, which is going to be called Becoming a Poet. And that's going to be coming out with Bloomsbury sometime next year. She made me feel like my poetry could be understood entirely and appreciated and I'd never had that feeling before. And the way she talked about poetry, she really sparkled when she was talking about it. And I started to realise that we had a connection. So I started to research into poetry accessibility, poetry education, the way this teaches young people what poetry is. When I started to see all of the work that Sue was putting out into the world and I realised that that's what I wanted to be doing. It was so validating to see her talk with so much conviction about something that I knew I felt really strongly about but didn't have the words for yet. So she completely inspired me. We were both very busy people in our 20s and 30s and 40s but later on we've become really close again, very, very close. With my dad becoming ill and and my wife being the main people who looked after him and Sue was constantly finding out how he was. She loved my boys, Mike and Harry. I think she made a, a conscious decision early on not to have her own children. And she lived her love of children through other people's children. So she always trying to help Mike and Harry, you know, help tutor them and teach them to cook. When Mike was going to university, she had him up there teaching him basic things he could make himself when he was in his sticks and always wanted to be there for us, which is brilliant. Last year, 2022, Sue had a big birthday. It was her 60th. And Sue asked me to DJ the event. Sue sent me a long list of the tunes that she wanted to play and all of Sue's choices were absolutely bang on. I had a full dance floor for the whole time, which is not bad going for a 60th birthday party. And Sue basically danced the night away because she always, always loved to dance. Sue was diagnosed with breast cancer just after we returned from a wonderful trip to New Zealand. The treatment was terrible at times, but she didn't let cancer stop her doing the things she loved. She kept working and writing, pushing herself to try new things. Those last seven years brought us even more closely together, especially during the pandemic. She treasured the time we spent with friends. She kept doing the things she loved, being with her family, cooking, entertaining, gardening, gigs, movies, dance, theater, reading, writing. She was overjoyed when Peggy's Skylight opened. We went there often, including on her last birthday. And we kept traveling to Japan, most memorably, to Norway, France, Holland, Hungary, Romania, Ireland, all over the UK. She squeezed all the joy out of life that she could. And then when she came home from hospital to die, she and Tracy set up the still partnership that we've been putting off. She did die happy. She completed her life. She was satisfied. I'm not sure how many of us will be able to say that. Sue and I lost touch in the middle years, but thanks to Richard and Linda, I found her again. And we had another 13 years of friendship and we got Dave into the bargain. 
we shared Sue's last holiday with them on Malta. And even though her illness was treating her really cruelly, she still made the absolute best of it with her talent for finding joy in everything. And as she became really poorly, I was privileged to spend a lot of time with Sue and Dave. She did everything fiercely. It was palpable, her love for Dave and Trina, Michael and Harry and her Dave. It emanated from her in those last days. And when she told Dave she was happy, I believe she really was. She'd achieved so much. She'd married her Dave. She'd written even more and she knew she was loved. We, have a dear, we had a dear friend called Stanley Middleton who lived very close to here, just around the corner in fact. He was a fine novelist. Uh, he wrote Holiday, which won the Booker Prize some years ago. Uh, he died in 2009 and his widow, Margaret, has lived in the same gorgeous house for many, many years. And she's just about to move out of it and it's a very sad time for everyone but happy too that she's going to be nearer her children. When Stanley died, we were away on holiday in Jura, and we were out walking. We didn't find out about his death until the following day, and this is a poem dedicated to him. Different Sky. We talk and walk the Jura headland. You are with us, yet miles away in your final bed. We are alone but not alone. A pheasant stalks among parched grasses. Eagles soar hot blue. We brush through shoulder-high bracken, stride out to an uninhabited island, rest a while on soft moss, secretive mountain saxifrage. After exploring the beach beneath, we come up through trees, from one delicious emptiness into another, a walled garden. The birds have it to themselves. Some shriek at our arrival, fly fast between each outdoor room, skim the tops of shrubs, scud across rose beds, cast shadows over lush lawns, sweep and rush us onward, eager to regain their kingdom. A blackbird lies low in the semi-privet, wings half spread. Is he sunning himself or waiting? In the meadow, where lucifer dragonflies hover over ox-eye daisies, an unexpected tea tent, unmanned but with china cups and cordials, shortbread and homemade bunting, the perfect place for an assignation. We sip tea and linger. A white cap flits between guy ropes, <coughs> skips across tables, looking for leavings. Nearby, in an ancient glass house, a green finch beats frantically against fine-covered windows, out of reach and beyond help. It is tiring with effort now, aching to escape to a different sky. Thank you. Good ones, aren't they? 